Good morning, everyone. Thank you for attending today's webinar on Who is Afraid of the Big Bad Bear. And Miguel, you can go ahead and introduce our presenter. Absolutely. Thank you so much, um, Iveta. So I'll be very brief um, because we want to jump right into the actual webinar. Um, today we have as presenter Jimena, Dr. Jimena Vélez Liendo. She's a Bolivian biologist uh, with many years of experience in Andean bear ecology and conservation. She got a PhD in ecology and evolution in Belgium. Uh, she has a master's degree uh, in geographic information systems from Leicester University in the UK and a bachelor degree from the University of San Simon in Cochabamba, Bolivia. She's a research conservation fellow at Chester Zoo and associate researcher Wild Crew, University of Oxford. And um, we're delighted to have you, Jimena, uh, here presenting today. Thank you. Um, good morning, everyone. I'm going to switch to my webcam for a few seconds so you can actually see me. Um, see if it see if it works. I think it is. So um, thank you very much. Um, it's um, it's a lovely invitation um, from Miguel and people from NatureServe. Um, I'm delighted to be here and I will introduce you to all of you into my world of um, Andean bear conservation through this very interesting topic of who is afraid of the big bad bear. So I'm going to switch off my camera now and um, we can start. So um, as I said, I would like to extend my thanks to the um, to the to, to the Nature Surf family for inviting me um, to give this webinar uh, to all of you. Um, as Miguel said, I'm a conservation fellow at Wild Crew, University of Oxford, and I'm the principal researcher at the Andean Bear Conservation Bear Project in Bolivia. Uh, the project is based in the southern part of the country, uh, and we have the privilege to work along with Promita our in-country NGO and NatureSurf member. So in the next 30 minutes, 35 minutes, um, I, will, um, I will give you information about um, the Andean bear uh, and especially our project. So let's start. Um, okay. okay, so um, elusive and rare and expensive and very very much labor intense mega charismatics and beasts of waste and desolation as this, as theodore roosevelt once described the wolf large carnivores are a challenging group to study and undertake conservation measures on one hand bears tigers and wolves have become worldwide symbols for conservation and environmental awareness but on the other hand large carnivores are persecuted and killed because they are considered competitors for resources and threat to livestock and even to human lives this law for hate perception makes conservation initiatives for this group of mammals extremely complex the andean bear is the largest carnivore and endemic species of the andes males can reach easily two meters high and weigh approximately 100 to 150 kilos. Females are usually a third smaller. After the giant panned bear, the Andean bear is the most vegetarian species of all, of all eight bear species. It is highly specialized to eat hard vegetative matter like bromeliads and bamboo. However, as an opportunistic species, the Andean bear can hunt and feed on animal protein. Bears inhabit five Andean countries, 
starting from the north, from Venezuela, Colombia, Ecuador, Peru, and Bolivia. And as you can see in this latest map, the habitat is fragmented, highly fragmented, actually. Bears are adapted to live in tropical dry forests, but also they are found in tropical moist lowland and mountain forests, tropical dry and moist shrublands, and tropical high altitude shrublands sh sh and grasslands. According to the latest IUC and Red List assessment, the Andean bear is under the category of vulnerable. The assessment was based on habitat suitability and connectivity analysis, and the results shows an approximately 30% of the habitat is unsuitable to sustain a viable Andean bear population. The assessment showed three main threats. The first one, habitat loss, um, is referring to the expansion of the agriculture frontier together with a very, very poor agriculture practice. And all those um, activities have been the main drivers of the loss of natural ecosystems. In addition, mining and oil exploitation are becoming an increasing menace not only to bears, but also to local communities. Conversion of land to coca crops and drug trade together with the guerrilla groups in some parts of the Andes, favor a lawless land use system that also impacts the quality of the Andean bear habitat and also the bear probability of a long-term survival. Illegal killing. Illegal killing is an important but unfortunately underestimated threat for Andean bears. Based on a review um, carry out for the red list assessment, an average of 180 bears are known to be killed every year across the range. However, the experts recommend that this number is much, well, it's very low comparing what we are seeing during the past years, and they, th and, and they also consider that this um, threat is increasing. Climate change. Um, global projections of the effects of climate change shows a general tendency towards absolute displacement of the mountain biome, suggesting that the tropical Andes is among the most vulnerable region to climate change. However, for the Andean bear um, people, um, for, for the experts, when we assess climate change as a threat, we assess through the point of view of a bear. Um, <clears throat> because of these changes in, in climate patterns, uh, food availability in most of the forests have declined or is, or is modifying, is, is, is changing. Um, so, so in a way, climate change is affecting the quality of, the, of, of these forests. Um, and it's likely that all the ecosystems associated with the Andean bears uh, at some point will exhibit some reduction in their extension as well as a reduction in the quality of the of the habitat. So in 2016, a conservation scientist from Chester Sioux and Wild Crew, along with our um, in-country partner from ETA and the Natural um, History Natural History Museum uh, in Cochabamba. Uh, launch a pilot project focusing on human wildlife conflict um, to, um, to implement a bear conflict mitigation and poverty alleviation strategies. In 2017, uh, the project won a Whitley Award. Um, so we had an one year to proof of concept uh, focusing on this particular area in the south of Bolivia the uh, the interandian dry forest of um, Tarija. the the aim of our conservation initiative was to build a cross-disciplinary approach between natural and social science to understand and develop effective measures to reduce conflict with humans so again um this is the this is the um, this is the map of the um, of the global distribution of the Andean bear, but the project is based in the very very southern part of the of the distribution, 
is the um, is a dry forest. Uh, and according to WWF in 2016, um, 2006, sorry, um, the dry forests are classified as critically endangered. Um, in terms of um, bear ecology and biology, these ecosystems are the least studied of all of them and are highly fragmented, uh, not only because of our recent human activities, but also through um, past um, human activities, including the the, uh, the Inca Empire, for instance. So based on previous reports on incidents with bears, uh, socioeconomic background of the communities um, and the bear and tropical dry forest conservation priorities, um, the, the group identified this region as our study area. In general terms, uh, the area is um, characterized by mid-elevated mountains, between 1,200 to up to 3,000 meters above sea level. Uh, it's marked by really hot and wet summer, cold, dry winters. And um, as I said, although much of the forest competition has changed due to human intervention, these valleys are considered important center of endemisms and home of the largest three carnivores in South America, bears, jaguars, and pumas. The area, as I said, as I mentioned before, is highly fragmented and the social background of the communities are, are extremely challenging because poverty levels are above 80% in the majority of them. Climate change affecting not only the economic activities, but also, and not surprising, uh, people's tolerance towards large carnivores. In fact, um, due to changes in main economic activities from agriculture to livestock, carnivore livestock encounters has increased. And therefore people not only lose livestock, but also the forest lose their quality because they cannot support uh, livestock, not in those uh, current numbers. So the project has three main research areas. The first one is bear ecology. Since 2016, we have deployed um, 45 um, camera uh, stations uh, in an area of approximately 400 square kilometers. Each station um, has two cameras, one in front of the other, and the distance to the nearest um, camera trap is at least one kilometer and a half. Although there are some camera stations that they have a uh, shorter distance, but that's because um, we've been collecting um, very important information about the bears. So now let me show you some really, really nice pictures about our work. So this was the first um, bear photographed in the region. It is a cub because as you can see, there's the mother in front of the camera trap. Um, this was a really, really good news for the, um, for the group because um, until the end of 2016 um, and after five months of, um, of camera trapping, we didn't get any, any picture of a bear. So at some point we were wondering whether we arrived too late for the bears. So getting this picture uh, was a really, really great news for, for the team, and especially because we knew that there was a breeding population. After that picture, we, we collect other, other, other pictures of, um, of bears. Um, and although our first estimations of bear populations for that area was much, much higher, we were expecting between 20 to 25 individuals. Um, we we have at the moment um, only five five um, bears identified by their marks, um, but we believe that um, uh, with the next um, stage of the project we will we will follow and we will get more more bears. Um, besides the the um, the bear photographs that we were very excited um, to get. We also got a lot of other um, photographs from um, other animals. 
And uh, the next pictures I'm going to show you, they, they belong primarily um, from, from carnivores. Um, so we have we we got these two pictures um, the yellow um, the um, uh, Lycalopex hymnocercus and Cerdosian thos. Both Canada species have not been recorded for this ecosystem. Then, of course, we got uh, pictures of uh, pumas. Pumas. We have a lot of pumas in the area. But now here we have the first picture of a margay. Um, uh, again, this uh, these, um, small cat has not been recorded for the, um, for the dry forests. Um, Geoffroy cat, uh, which we got a lot of pictures of Geoffroy cat. And this one in particular, which I hope you managed to find it. So this is the first picture of a pampas cat in the dry forest. And it's just below uh, that rock, so it is there. It's um, it's the only picture that we got, but that's it's showing the importance of um, the dry forests in terms of um, in terms of um, of getting um, uh, more information about the biodiversity and in all of those species. Uh, then we have other really cute uh, pictures of Tyra. Tyra again, and this beautiful southern Tamandua. Um, on top of all of these pictures, we got a series of um, thousands of thousands of thousands of cows and bulls, uh, which is also showing us that really the impact of livestock in these um, fragile ecosystems is very high. Secondly, um, the project works on capacity building. We work uh, with local community members. Um, we, we train them in setting up camera traps, the use of GPS, and collect the basics of um, information on, on the ecosystem. Um, and we decided to uh, work with um, with communities and community members, um, following the the great successful project of uh, Erika Cuellar with parabiologists in the Chaco region. Um, and also, it is a way that um, we can um, we can provide an extra income for these people, um, and also to let them. Um, know that the knowledge is extremely valuable. Um, so at the moment, um, in the field, we have about uh, we we have about six um, uh, field assistants who are, I mean, they all of them they um, they got the basics in in camera trapping and GPS, and now all of them. They, they carry out all the checks, they, they check the camera traps, they change the batteries, they change the memory cards. So they are very well, um, they are very well trained and also they are very interested in learning more about the bears. Um, the third component, and this was the most challenging component, especially for me, was to work with people. Um, I'm a bear biologist and I do not work with people. So even talking with people was quite uh, challenging for me. I was always rather uh, prefer to, um, to go into the fields and collect bear poop rather than talking with people. But anyway, that's my, that's my job now. So um, I had to, uh, to work with them. And um, so as you can see me here, extremely stressed talking with these people about bears and cattle. And people are very difficult because they can change their minds from one day to the other. And um, all your investment can be, you know, can be destroyed from one day to the other. So building this um, relationship with the community was um, very tricky and and very long and, and it is a long process um we've been working with them for already 18 months and still i i i get the feeling that we haven't 
trust completely one to the other but that's but that's all right so for this for this section we 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 carry out surveys um and we carry out um um and we build um oral maps like this one because we wanted to assess um first what is i mean what are the the boundaries of the year um, of the communities? How do they see their community? How do they perceive animals? How do they um, and and whether they can tolerate and and what is the level of tolerance um, for bears and in, in, in pumas? So we build these um, these maps along with the with the communities. Um, but also what we did was. Um, the surveys um, now surveys were a little bit tricky because the majority of these people of of the community members are quite old people and and few of them know how to read and write so there was another challenge for for the for the group um, for the team um, to work with these um, with these um, with these groups but at the end um, we we carry out these surveys and work with uh, especially with key informants in in order to assess the attitudes and perceptions and tolerance to bears and pumas and we also carry out these um, socioeconomic um, assessments so our work so far has revealed that community attitudes to bears are indeed quite negative and bears and pumas and other carnivores are usually blamed uh, and uh, retaliated against uh, for um, livestock and crop losses. However, there is very little empirical evidence to support those individual claims. So in this case, for instance, we, we got the call that a bear made a kill of this cow, but there wasn't any evidence that the bear made a kill. Yes, there were signs the bear was was feeding on the cow on, on the on, on the carcasses, but nothing about um, that the bear made a kill. But it's still, you know, retaliatory killing. It's quite common, and um, and they kill the bear. So. Um, after the socioeconomic assessments and the workshops and all the work that we've been carrying out during 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 this during this year, we were we were asked ourselves again, who is afraid of the big and bad bear? Um, and the answer at some point, I mean, because we we had a very 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 profound <laughs> um, discussion about this, uh, and the answer was actually nobody. Nobody is afraid of big bad bear. The 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 problem here is that the biggest threat to this animal is not fear, but it is the lack of value to local people. People don't see the value of sharing, of coexisting with these animals. Um, so for the team to understand that we have to put a value not always economic economic value but it can be also a proud that they can feel proud to share the um, to coexist with these animals so there are different terms of value that we are uh, addressing at the moment so just to have an um an overall idea of 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 the project so um what our project has identified so far is that um there is an cultural importance of uh, of having livestock for the people um but there is an economic perception of wealth when they have livestock however livestock um causes habitat degradation and also increases the encounter with large carnivores and something that i forgot to include here is that livestock actually it's not a profitable activity for these communities because um, there is a really high competition for prices with the Argentinian um, um, with Argentinian beef and also beef coming from the lowlands of the country so in terms of price um, a kilo of um, beef from these areas where we're working at the moment um, probably it's about um, 
how it was that like three dollars per kilo but um a kilo from um from the um from uh fr from argentina or or the lowlands are 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 much much um it is cheaper and also people prefer that type of um of beef so the livestock causes habitat degradation and also increases uh, encounters with large carnivores, which in turn um, increases the human bird conflict. Um, uh, and because of uh, and because of this um, conflict, uh, people decrease tolerance towards bears, um, and then therefore um, retaliatory killing affects uh, not only um, bears and pumas, but also can threat. Um, the species um, to extinction, as we've been seeing in a um, in a different area. So um, now our strategy, um, based based on those eighteen months of research, uh, but most of all the the eighteen years that we've been working with bears, uh, we have developed a strategy based on our experiences. In our countries, um, we have experience in human wildlife conflict um, in Assam with elephants, and tigers in Nepal, and at the moment we're working with bats in Mauritius. Um, we are focusing here on provide a value uh, to this species to people. So the strategy that we are presenting is to reduce livestock through sustainable economic alternatives. Um, these, alter these economic alternatives are discussed with the communities um, and, um, and it's not about uh, payments of, for ecosystem services or, 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 or any of those um, types of, um, of um, alternatives. Um, the, the alternatives that we are uh, developing with the communities are first um, uh, eco-friendly. I mean, we 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 identified uh, um, alternatives that can be um, easy for them to um, to use and to apply. And um, because as I uh, as I mentioned, we're working with uh, with with all people, so we needed to identify something that could be suitable for their age range. Um, so the strategy um, is to identify these economic alternatives um, following several um, several um, characteristics um, in order to primarily is to reduce the livestock because livestock is the is the threat for both for humans and for bears um, once that uh, we can produce the livestock then the forests can be restored because at the moment um, forests are extremely fragile because of this high impact of the livestock. Um, and therefore, uh, we can reduce bear killings and also puma killings. And ultimately, we hope to reach coexistence. Um, so we started with this strategy at the beginning of the year. Um, and in May 2016, um, this was our first uh, no, May 2018, sorry. Um, this was our first group of beekeepers uh, formed in, in, in our study site. Um, the communities, they identify beekeeping as one of the economic, potential economic alternatives based on the demand, based on the low, um, low uh, price in, you know, they, they don't, the investment is not really high, um, and also it's very it's it's eco friendly. It's good for it's good for the forests. So um, this was our first picture with our uh, first group um, in 2018 uh, in May of this year. And three months later, uh, we were building our first communal beehives. So from eight people, we ended up with a group of uh, 16 people. And to date, we have three communities committed to work with the, within this framework. Um, now, the deal 
is to one, as I mentioned, to identify eco-friendly activities in order to reduce livestock. Um, so the project provides parts of the funds needed and the communities put the other part in money, right? Um, and also we provided training and the marketing for the products while they commit to zero bear poaching and to reduce livestock numbers. So um, after this, you know, these activities, um, these um, activities that we're carrying out at the moment, um, the team has been, you know, because we are just starting, we we can't really assess whether this is the solution or not. But um, something that we that we are committed from from the minute that we started working with communities is that we have to develop an economic alternative that at some point they will be um, that they can that they can do it their themselves without our help. Um, and that can be also um, that they can see also the value of sharing um, the habitat with the bear, because without without the honey, without the without the lavender, which is the other economic alternatives um, identified, um, the um, without the bear they wouldn't have those activities. Um, so we're trying to also work on um, on behavioral change with most of these communities uh, in order to accept uh, the, um, these, these activities and also uh, to reach coexistence with, um, with, with these animals. Um, so my final uh, message after all these years um, working with bears is that um, coexistence is possible, um, but basically we need to empower communities and to develop and, and and we really need to develop an effective and the bear conservation plan um but as i said um conservation has evolved um from keeping the animals locked in a protected area to giving to give these um the the power or the decision to communities because at the end of the day i mean um we don't live with those animals. It's people who coexist with them. So, um, so that's the um, that's our that's our final message as as a project. So, um, um, I just want to thank you all for um, for your time uh, to be with me. I'll, um, I'm extremely extremely grateful. I apologize for my. Um, for breaking up at some points, but um, sometimes I get quite emotion emotional about um, about bears. So thank you very much, and thank you, Nature Surf, for giving me these uh, this this time. And of course, I want to thank all these um, organizations that are supporting our project. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jimena. We we are nature are the ones that feel extremely thankful for 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 your sharing and uh, the wonderful and necessary uh, work on the and and bear. I would like to open uh, the floor for questions uh, from the audience now. Uh, you can ask your questions in English or Spanish if you if you prefer. You can write them in the little chat window that we have uh, on 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 the go to webinar control panel, or you could actually raise your hand and we can unmute so you can ask the question uh, yourself. We do have a, a comment by um, Patrick Christ, and he says, great presentation and great work. Oh, thank you. <clears throat> Okay, um, I will give um, the floor to Bruce Yang. He has a question. 
Go yeah, ahead, Bruce. Uh, yes. Hello, can you yes. hear me? Yes. Great. Well, so no, I agree with uh, Patrick. Fantastic uh, presentation. Thank you so much for uh, sharing um, this fascinating work and uh, very challenging as well. I, I just had a um, just a, a, a quick question on that. The slide where you showed um, the locations of the camera traps, mm -hmm. I noticed that the pins were of different colors. I didn't know if that meant anything or um, didn't didn't um, explain that. Um, I was just curious about that. Thank you. Thank you, Bruce, for your question. And now the um um the they only they only uh show the difference in uh, the time because we got the um, this this is a project that was that was uh, starting in 2016 with only uh 15 camera traps. So we set all those 15 camera traps and then a few months later we got a grant to get an extra um 30 units so that that's the only difference but not nothing major there were there there is only one uh one um camera that we that we kept in red and that's where we got our first andean bear pictures so that's um that's to remind us that we don't have to move that camera trap that's all thank you okay. i see can I, can I ask just a quick follow-up question yes. miguel all right. Um, no, so just curious, um, I, I, I'm always interested um, in these camera trap studies in, in places with, uh, you know, local people moving around. Um, did you, I mean, I, I thought it was brilliant to involve the locals in setting up the cameras, um, but um, um, in doing so, I mean, did you, what kind of, what was your kind of loss rate of the cameras? I mean, I mean imagine some of them disappeared or, or, or not, or how did that work out? Yeah, that's that's a very good question because um, at the moment we lost. Um, let me see, dun, 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 like about uh, four camera traps, but four camera traps because of the bear. <laughs> the bear, oh, the bear wow. destroyed, <laughs> the bear destroyed our camera traps because um, as we got them brand new, uh, that was really really funny because um, we set up immediately, um, and the bear simply they don't like the smell of brand new Bushnell camera traps uh, which was quite hilarious and it was quite sad actually um, but yeah um, that was our only loss oh, oh yes um, we lost um, one memory card uh, because it was one of those as uh, micro SD camera traps um, uh, micro SD uh, memory card so as you can imagine, uh, most of the mobile phones use um, SD cards. So there was someone who was interested in increasing his or her uh, mobile phone memory. So he just went to our camera traps, removed the, the, the lead, took the um, memory card, and that's it. But we haven't lost um, due to um, people stealing our camera traps which it's very very good because that means that um you know people respect that uh the equipment is not um it belongs to the community because that's something that we said from the very beginning this is your equipment so they can i mean and also they see the benefits of having this camera trap sets in uh set up in their um in their community because they can also follow um whether um there is a different livestock coming in or if there's also people uh, that they don't belong um to the community so they can they can they 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 actually they actually see as a benefit and i think that was um good um a good point for our project okay, okay. excellent Patrick, uh, Patrick Kreis has a question. I'll unmute you. Go ahead. Patrick, uh, are you, are you still? Yeah. I'm unmuted now. Thanks. Um, yeah, thank you. I thought the um, substitution of the economic activity was really creative, and we'd really look forward to hearing an update on um, how that's working out. I was curious about the uh, selection of the bees though I and sorry if I missed a detail there but I was wondering if these are native or naturalized bees or if there was any concern about competition of native pollinators with exotic bees thank you thank you Patrick for your question yes um, 
we are using native species uh, primarily because um, native bee species are adapted to the ecosystem, to the forest, because as I said at the beginning, um, this is uh, a very, very challenging um, uh, habitat because it's, it, it can get really, really hot in summer, uh, but also quite cold in winter. So if we bring um, bees from from a different ecosystem, um, different habitat, they might probably not um, get adapted as well as the local um, bees. So um, during these months, we've been identifying the locations of, of uh, local bees to get transported um, to the beehives. Um, we understand that the production of uh, honey and other products might be quite low because you know they, these are native species. But that's also an added value that we're going to put in our final products um, because the aim is to produce um, uh, a product with the higher standards, um, both uh, for the ecosystem and also for the market. Um, and our market studies are showing us that people really appreciate uh, when the products actually comes from native species, um, you know, to keep the most natural um, environment as possible. So, so yeah, so to answer your question, sorry. Yes, we're using local endemic species bees. Great, thank you. Thank you, Patrick. And um, Dr. Carlos Zambrana says, great presentation. Have you performed any econo an economic or market study to identify the most profitable activity? Um, I think, as I mentioned, um, the um, the economic alternatives that we identified was based on on what people wanted at the beginning. Um, of course, we had like a lot of ideas of you know bringing more livestock or bringing you know a bull or two bulls or you know, things. Um, but then there was there was this community that we worked with. Uh, uh, they said um, if we could provide some capacity in uh, beekeeping because they got some beehives many years ago and and they and they saw that um, prices in the cities for honey is quite high and that was quite fitting our uh, our um, expectations because um, after that meeting we um, we were working uh, well. We were working with Prometa, and Prometa has an extensive experience in beekeeping. And actually, they were the ones who were advising to go uh, and and try um, uh, beekeeping for this uh, for one of the economic alternatives. So when the market studies were 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 carried out, uh, they showed that there is an increase in demand of this product. But also, it's not only a regional high demand of honey, but also it's a national high demand of all products, not only honey. Um, so we were, we are actually quite positive about uh, the results of this um, of this project. Thank you so much, and we have greetings from Ecuador. Uh, Thank you very much for the presentation. This is from Maria Villaruel. She asked, I would like to ask if there are other types of local actors like owners of private reserves. In case there are, how did you work with them? Right, okay. Um, the region, um, there's, no, there's no protected areas. That's the other. That's the other um, factor why we are working in these um, in these um, in this part of the country. There is a lack of protected areas. Uh, there is no um, uh, municipal uh, municipal or any any sort of protected areas. Although um, there is a small project that is trying to um, create a protected area for the Andean bear, but this needs to be um, further discussed because um, all the land is, um, is private land. Okay. And uh, Patrick McIntyre from NatureServe says, thank you for a great presentation. I was curious 
if interested in other wildlife has if interest in other wildlife has increased in the community with the use of camera trips, especially if photos are shared with children. Um, that was very interesting because they didn't know they had uh, two species of, uh, of canids. They didn't know they had, they never saw um, Pampas cat. So they were very, very surprised when they saw the pictures. Um, they were even, you know, there was discussions about whether we brought those animals from the zoo and we said, no, we don't. We don't do that. Um, but also, you know, that gives the um, the, the the information uh, of uh, how little even they know about um, their local biodiversity. Uh, at the moment, we are also following the steps of, um, I mean, in the camera traps, we got everything um, and, 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 and even some um, potentially critically endangered uh, species. Uh, which needs to be to be reviewed and, and and also people when we show the picture of that of that particular species they just called you know like a normal oh yeah that's the rat it's a rat and and at the museum they said no it's not just a rat it is a critically endangered chinchilla rat um, so um, so yeah it's very very interesting to um, to see their reactions when they see this this species Excellent, thank you. We have uh, an additional question from uh, Yara Lascano Higueras. Jimena, nice. muchas felicidades por el proyecto. Me parece importante destinar los esfuerzos hacia el sur de, de Bolivia. Tengo una consulta. ¿Estás considerando ampliar el mismo estudio subiendo hacia el suroeste de Chuquisaca, donde se cuenta con áreas en muy buen estado de conservación y que han sido propuestas para áreas protegidas? Por ejemplo, las chapeadas. Mm -hmm. Okay, do you want me to answer in English or Spanish? Please, in Spanish, please. Okay, sí, um, el proyecto tiene, la, tiene, tiene ya previsto la, la ampliación de la, del proyecto y precisamente hacia las chapeadas. Es, una, es realmente una iniciativa que puede ayudar a, primero a conocer si los osos que tenemos en este lado están cruzando el río para las chapeadas, que sería algo, algo muy importante de detectar. Um, pero también eh, el proyecto tiene otros dos, dos, áreas, dos áreas de trabajo, en, uh, una en Cochabamba y el otro es en la Serranía del Iñau, que acaba de terminar, pero vamos a conseguir fondos para que se pueda continuar. Pero um, Con Yara esperamos de que la iniciativa pueda incluso incluir eh, incluirlos a ellos para que para que podamos trabajar en una alianza mucho más fuerte en el para el sur del país. Thank you for that. And Ellie Linden, who is joining us here in the Arlington office, asks: Was there a reason why you chose the study area to be? at the southernmost section of the bear's population. Did you have the best access to that area or was there an ecological reason like analyzing possible rain shifts due to climate change? Um, that's a very, very interesting question. Um, and a lot of people ask me, why the South? Um, and basically uh, the answer is in 2010, um, an assessment uh, was carried out for the whole um, uh, department of Tarija, which is the southern part of, of, of the country. Um, and that particular area um, showed, showed um, conflict with people. Um, we found um, bare bare food remains uh, quite fresh um, and the habitat was something completely different as what I was as what I saw um, during the past um, years uh, of working with bears uh, so when we when we carry out further for the research we found that um, the the area is um, is a is a dry forest 
so it's um, it's very fragile in terms of uh, the, eco um, the ecology of the of the dry forest is extremely fragile. Um, secondly, um, uh, human human population is extremely poor, as I mentioned before. Uh, all of them are above the eighty percent of um, of poverty. Um, the third reason is that um, there's no protected areas. So these these population needs somehow need somehow to be protected. And the fourth reason is um, we're working in the southernmost part of the country, um, in, in the southernmost most part of the distribution of the bear worldwide. Um, and there is a there is a need there is an, um, an important need um, to protect those um, those populations in terms of the genetic information that they can carry that, that they carry. Um, so those were the reasons that we decided to start from the bottom, then going going up to the north. Thank you for that. And I actually have a question that was. Um, uh, inspired by Patrick McIntyre's uh, question, uh, and that is, I know you mentioned that um, the majority of, of the population in the community you studied um, was of an older generation, but I wanted to see um, if you uh, were thinking of also kind of targeting the younger generation and, and seeing um, if the younger generation can be educated in, uh, through their you know, school system about the value uh, mm -hmm. of the black bear and make sure that the next generation has uh, a different uh, mind uh, a mind shift in the way they uh, value. Yeah, yeah. I mean, um, th uh, that's that's one of our um, goals for the next months, for the next year, actually. Um, with the support of uh, Chester Sue, um, we have an incredible team working on education. Um, so. So we have developed an um, uh, and a strategy to um, to increase the knowledge about Andean bears. Uh, we have an, a strategy to um, to work with with um, with the schools um, because each school has a primary uh, section, and um, we are. I mean, population. Population size is quite small. I mean, we're working with uh, what is it like about 200 households, um, and at each school we have um, 18 children, then uh, 25, uh, in another we have five students. But all of them, all of them, are very, very eager to know about the bear. And um, for the next school year back in Bolivia, uh, which starts in February, uh, we are aiming to um, to develop a series of um, short stories um, written by the students about the bear, but they can also write about you know other 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 animals. Um, so in a way that we want to encourage them to um, to learn more about this animal to see the animal because they never they never saw a bear they 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 only heard about the stories about the bear so when we show them the pictures and especially when we show them the videos they just they they get fascinated they 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 are a little bit scared at the beginning but then um they they even make comments about oh um that that's really that's really nice that is really cool uh, they even, you know, make some stories about the, the powers of the bear, which is really, really nice. So we want to use that to our advantage in um, and, and, and work uh, specifically with the primary sections uh, the next year, the, the next 13 months that we have with this project. Okay, excellent. I have a question. So. Yeah. Um, in regards of the pictures, do you use any image recognition software to analyze the pictures? I know that a camera trap can produce thousands of pictures, as you well said. Not all of them, I imagine, has um, have the, 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 the image that you are looking for. 
How do you analyze? Can you uh, perhaps touch on this aspect? Well, um, bears um, and the bears can be identified by the facial marks, the white marks around uh, surrounding their eyes or the white marks on the chest, the neck. Um, we can use um, that type of software that you mentioned with um, with uh, with pumas. We can use it with Geoffrey uh, with all other small cats. And in fact, one of my students, she's doing um, is doing that. She's working on um, on on identifying individuals um, using that type of software. Um, however, having said that, um, in um in a study that we made a couple of years ago, we found that uh, bear marks can change during the time. So if a project is taking pictures of bears for more than two years, three years, it's very likely that their individuals might change their facial patterns. So we we are cautious about um, that as well. Um, uh but yeah but um, i mean just to answer your question yes we are using um some of that technology wow fascinating well i don't think we have more questions i want to say thank you again from the nature Safe family to you jimena for a wonderful presentation i think i personally learned so much today about um this animal that lives in my country and i hope that it was uh, the same for other people attending the webinar I want to remind everybody that we will post this webinar online for people that was not able to attend uh, the live presentation that Jimena gave today. And um, again, thank you so much, Jimena. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, um, thank you all um, for this opportunity. Uh, it was actually was was very nice. It was my first time that I gave a webinar, so so thank you very much. And if you have any other question or if you want to contact us. Um, I will leave all my details um, with Miguel and, and feel, please feel free to, um, to email me. Thank you.